My name is Lisa Sipienko and uh, I will be chairing today's event. So we're starting a ser exciting series of new events, HTM question. This is our first event. And um, we plan to have uh, four events, which will run all the way into next year, into April. And um, today we're starting with looking at the controversial question of quality of data for decision making in HTA. So I would like to uh, first introduce our distinguished panel. Um, the four experts that you see on your screen will be present at uh, all four events. Um, and um, Dan Ollendorf um, was at ISO Review in the US, the US organization responsible for HTA, and currently he's at the Center for the Evaluation of Risk and um, Value and Risk and Health at Tufts. Professor Carol Longson um, was on the board of NICE for almost two decades and the director of um, Technology Appraisals Program and the Center looking at technology appraisals. So Dr. Vaya Artwein um, is an academic in the Netherlands who spent her entire career in um, HTA and the, currently she's a president of HTI. And Eric Law um, represented patient organization as a CEO of Myeloma UK for 20 years and was really connected to the HTA world and continues to play a very big role across different HTA agencies. So I will be moderating today's session as a CEO of Consilium Scientific. And today we have two uh, guest experts. We're very pleased to have uh, Professor Ian Tanag from University of Toronto. He is an Emeritus Professor of Medicine and Medical Biophysics at Princess Margaret Cancer Center. And he's a prominent oncologist and an expert on clinical trials. Ian is removed from the world of HTA and this is an excellent value for us to have an external perspective. And Dr. Frank Halstrad is joining us from Belgium. He is representing the Belgium uh, HTA agency, uh, Belgium Healthcare Knowledge Center. So you can read detailed biographies of all our experts online. And uh, I would like to now um, give the introduction to today's topic. So we are looking at quality of data for decision making, the evidence that HTA agencies uh, receive to make reimbursement decisions and to give guidance to the payers. So let's first start with the dream. What do health technology assessment agencies would like to ideally have? And uh, it's classic answer. Of course, it starts with randomized clinical trials, which are adequately sized and powered. Um, these trials should have clinically relevant comparators with reflecting clinical practice. Um, they need to be powered on final endpoints, preferably endpoints which are clinically relevant to patients. Um, each agency was, would like to have a quality of life data collected at relevant time points with uh, appropriate instruments. And the trials should be run in patients which are representative of patients in a given jurisdiction. And uh, if they need to include uh, subgroups uh, if it's um, logical to have predefined by logically plausible subgroups for decision making. And that's just a short list among many other requirements that HTA agencies would like to see when they're receiving evidence from the industry on new therapeutics. Reality, of course, looks very different and uh, often very frustrating for the decision makers because uh, what we actually see in HTA agencies more and more these days is an increasing number of single arm trials, uh, increasing number of trials using surrogate endpoints rather than final endpoints, inadequate comparators, if we have any comparators at all. Uh, often we're lacking quality of life data because evidence is more often than not is now being submitted with only phase two trials and quality of life data is often not collected there. Uh, we're facing uh, trials with unrepresentative populations. And most importantly, uh, we often see trials which are not answering clinically patient or system relevant questions. So 
to make decisions, um, the agencies have to rely more and more on extensive use of assumptions because trials are short, um, number of patients in the trials are small, extrapolations need to be made to make decisions. And this is a vicious cycle which is accelerating. This problem has been increasing for different reasons. And uh, the question is, what do we do about it? And there are a number of mitigation attempts that have been suggested. Some of these um, attempts is the use of modeling as, the, as I mentioned before, but confidential price discounts used across the board by many HDA agencies to mitigate uncertainty. Um, managed access agreements uh, is another instrument which became more popular over the recent decades across different countries. And uh, we're starting to see more and more um, real world evidence um, in submissions to HTA, which sometimes is golden, sometimes it's inappropriate. But what uh, are these attempts solving the problems that HTA agencies are actually having? So this is what today is all about. We are going to see how better the evidence problems are in HTA and what can be done and by whom. And uh, I do uh, very much welcome your questions in the chat. Uh, you can raise your hand to ask a question from the panel, uh, but the panel has a lot to share with you as well. So I'm turning this discussion to our panel and we'll start with uh, first uh, with Ian and Frank. Uh, I would love to hear your perspectives first. So thank you, uh, Lisa. Uh, you've summarized the problems very well. I guess as, a, as an oncologist and clinical trialist, uh, I think the, the problems stem from the fact that almost all of the large trials now are sponsored by pharmaceutical companies. And clearly their aim is to make a profit. Now, sometimes the goals of making a profit and improving outcomes for patients are coherent, but sometimes they're not. Uh, and I think the problem is that there's not enough control over the way that the trials are designed and sponsored. You mentioned many of the problems. Uh, my good friend and colleague, Chris Booth, recently wrote a, a paper which reviewed modern uh, randomized trials. Uh, now, some 90% of them are sponsored by pharma. The government hasn't put the money or doesn't put the money into doing independent trials or extremely rarely. Um, in uh, those trials, uh, there are many of them that have inappropriate comparators. So if you use a comparator where the outcomes are relatively poor, and sometimes that's done on the excuse, well, this is what's used in the real world rather than the best evidence from previous trials, which is absolutely nonsense because if you say the patients aren't well enough to get the most recent treatment that may be more toxic, well, then they're not well enough to get the new agent that's being tested, which is often uh, more toxic. Their endpoints are a problem. 80% of the endpoints for trials that are put before um, registration agencies like the FDA and the EMA, instead of using overall survival and quality of life, which are the ultimate things we want to improve for patients, they use progression-free survival. And this is subject to considerable artifact. And we were recently working with a statistician showed that because of the phenomenon of informative censoring where people who drop out before reaching uh, the endpoint of, of tumor progression, that you can get an apparent benefit uh, from a drug that is totally inactive but toxic. And uh, so that is uh, very, very uh, worrying. And then, as you've said, there is a move towards accelerated approval for breakthrough drugs. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't some very good improvements in treatment, some of the immunotherapy, for example, but it's been extended quite widely. And although the FDA may require a subsequent randomized trial to be done, uh, 
in general, when that hasn't been done, the drugs have not been withdrawn. So, I mean, clearly pharma has done some good things, the development of the COVID vaccines is a good example. But on the other hand, only half of the current anti-cancer drugs out there have been shown to improve survival or quality of life. Quality of life is often very poorly uh, done. Uh, and uh, where they have done that, a lot of them have only done it in, by a trivial amount. So I do think we have a lot of problems and a lot of wastage in, in rather inferior drugs that have not been in, in, uh, adequately tested. So that's my soapbox and I'll, I'll hand over now to others. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ian. Frank, would you like to comment with the European perspective? Um... Well, what uh, Ian has uh, brought forward is, is very much the case also here in Europe. It's not different. Um, what I wanted to add is that the clinicians' needs, in fact, are the same needs as those of the health technology assessment bodies. And they want to see comparative data and uh, in order to practice evidence-based medicine. And um, so indeed, uh, the, the patient relevant population to be studied that reflects also the target population that will be reimbursed is, is critical to have it in the trial. On the intervention, and, and you mentioned in the immunotherapy, um, one aspect that we see less and less also with the biologicals is that the uh, dose finding and the duration of treatment is not always well investigated when it comes to the market. And that is, of course, also impacting the budget for the healthcare payers. So that's also an, an important uh, aspect of the intervention. And comparators um, among the HTA bodies, of course, there needs to be alignment when industry is advised uh, for the pivotal trials so that um, there cannot be any discussion on that. Um, and I think that is possible. And in terms of outcomes, indeed, as you mentioned, these uh, surrogates that have sometimes already proven to be not valid as an predictor of overall survival, um, but are still being used. Um, and that is a pity. Um, now, one aspect I wanted to add is the, um, the, the start of such a comparative data. Um, if, if we are now pushed into the post-market setting to generate um, comparative data, the problem is that this is the recruitment is then competing with uh, routine prescription and, and it's very difficult and, and delayed sometimes when uh, results become available. So um, my point would be to have these comparative data or these comparative trials at least started in the, the pre-market um, phase so that for the patients and the clinicians, the evidence becomes available much more early and, and that evidence-based medicine can be practiced more early. And patients also then have more rapidly access, not only to innovation, but evidence-based innovation. Over. Thank you, Frank. Very good uh, points from both you and Ian. And, um, here we deal with an interesting issue of speed and uh, the pressure comes from a lot of points in the system, from patients, uh, from clinicians, from industry, and obviously agencies are under a significant pressure to make decisions sooner and on the evidence that they have available. So for example, Frank, you brought an example saying we should start these studies, comparative studies pre-registration, risks are too high. So uh, we need to guarantee that there will be a license. So there are a lot of conflicting points here. So I'd like to hear from the main panel, uh, what it would be your feedback, how do we balance the speed with the uh, requirements that we would like to have? Uh, Vaya, please go ahead. Thank you, Lisa. Well, the point I wanted to raise is especially, I think, the alignment with the regulatory authorities. I think um, 
Frank mentioned it a bit, but he didn't make it very explicit. I think one of the issues is also that the regulators um, have different objectives compared to HDA agencies. So they, of course, focus on the benefit risk profile, while HDA agencies are focusing more on the indeed clinical relevant long term effects. But also in terms of the evidence that uh, industry is providing with regard to safety, I think also the way regulators uh, evaluate safety is different from what HDA agency do. And I think um, that is also potentially maybe a problem. I don't, I, I don't know. I'm also looking at E and that, of course, industry might target market approval by focusing on the evidence bars that are set by regulators. Well, the HDA agencies need different uh, evidence to uh, inform decision making. Um, also, the regulators, as far as I understand, can uh, or have the authority to determine the quality and the size of um, pre-approval clinical evidence. Uh, and then they can also ask for uh, post-approval trials, but that they have the authority, not the HDA agencies. So I think there should be more alignment with, uh, with the regulators that coordinate better, I think, when they set the post-approval recommendations. And now I understand from Frank that that should also be done pre-market. So I think indeed the optimization should be in the, in the whole um, line actually. Um, and I think also with regard to subpopulations, I think also the regulators, uh, I, I understood from, from literature that they, there is also some, some uh, uncertainty uh, that the, that the uh, authorities are dealing, have to deal with. So they probably also need more evidence. So why not align the uncertainties that regulators have to deal with and the HDA agencies have to deal with? That could be potentially one option. But I also would like to focus a bit on the parallel uh, scientific advice um, and maybe Car Carol can comment on that there is joint scientific advice uh, and that could also potentially be an option to align more the processes and finally but not least I think Lisa you made a very important point in your presentation about asking the relevant question and I think we are dealing with technology push from industry and we are dealing with policy relevant questions from HDA agencies. And these are often not aligned. So I think we should also be much more focusing on how to set, how to identify technologies and how to set the priorities for health technology assessment. Thank you. Thank you, Vaya. So Dan, you had your hand next and. Yeah, thanks very much. And uh, thanks for having me uh, be part of this, uh, this terrific discussion. So uh, kind of picking up on Vaya's point, the, the concern in my mind is that yes, regulators do have standards and they differ in some respects from the expectations that HTA bodies will have. But as a point of first principle, I'd like the regulators to live up to those standards just a bit more. So uh, accelerated approvals, Ian mentioned accelerated approvals, those are um, significant not only for oncology drugs, but for drugs in other spaces as well. Uh, you may have seen this week, there was a recent publication, researchers at Harvard and uh, Hussein Nasi from the London School of Economics published a review of 10 oncology drugs that received accelerated approvals from the FDA. Um, all 10 of these drugs but over a three year period failed to demonstrate an overall survival benefit in confirmatory trials. Only a small fraction of these have been voluntarily withdrawn from the market. And in some cases, the Oncology Drugs Advisory Committee to the FDA uh, recommended against withdrawal uh, because of other considerations, no other options on the market, et cetera. My question is, why does there even need to be a vote? If the FDA is saying, this is the, these are the conditions under which we'll grant an accelerated approval. And if you fail to live up to, to those conditions, why does there even need to be further discussion? It, the withdrawal should be essentially automatic at that point. So, so I think that's, that's one of the major concerns for me. 
Um, another one that was described in the problem statement that, you, that everyone may have seen is that uh, oftentimes, whether it's accelerated or not, when we see approvals come in for multiple technologies that are intended to target the same condition, sometimes HTA's hands are tied in that uh, there are subtle differences in trial design, uh, differences in measurement, differences in timing of that measurement that preclude even an indirect comparison of these new technologies, uh, which is unfortunate and also something that could have been avoided if the advice given by regulators to technology developers is consistent uh, and taking advantage of some of the joint advice programs that Bio was speaking to as well. So there's an opportunity to have those conversations early enough so that the evidence meets some minimum threshold for evaluation and we're not stuck with these challenges. Now, there may still be challenges. We may have uncontrolled studies because it's unethical to think of a control group in certain trial designs uh, and maybe other efforts will have to be made to, to mitigate the problem in those circumstances. But I think there are ways we can shore up the evidence base now, but those require essentially pre-approval and even pre-submission conversations. Thank you, Dan. Carol? Thanks very much, uh, Lisa, and also thank you uh, for organizing this, this really important and uh, very illustrious with all of the other uh, members of the uh, panel uh, conversation. I'm, I'm just going to sort of throw out a few comments um, and then maybe some, some reflections. And the first, the first one is this problem is not new. Um, many of us have been around in health technology assessment for a very long time. And it might have been amplified, it might have been magnified as the introduction of these accelerated processes have occurred, but it was, it was ever so. Um, and many of us have sat around uh, decision-making tables or observed decision-makers uh, in HTA, look at new technologies and uh, come to the realization that there's that the, the ever, they don't have the right evidence, um, they don't have enough evidence. What evidence they have is poor for decision making. And if if we think that that has ever, that has been, so I'm talking 18, 20 years. I'm not talking in months. I'm talking in years. I reflect on, notwithstanding some of the issues that we've raised here, actually, have we moved? Has the dial moved at all? And. That's, I think that's quite an interesting um, conversation to explore. Now, from my perspective, I think it has, and it may not have in the actual delivery of the evidence that is needed. Um, I think we've got a very, uh, we've got a mountain to climb there, but the mechanisms by which that could be achieved, I think are in place now and they never used to be. So we've already talked about parallel advice. Um, that wasn't around 20 years ago. It came in five, six years ago. It is not being used in the way that it should, but at least HTA, HTA agencies, HTA bodies, HTA experts have, have realized that they need to get into that regulatory space as early as they possibly can in order to ensure that at least the right conversations are happening at that point. So I think that's, that's a tick. Uh, good start could do a huge, huge amount uh, more. The, the second thing is the realization of, of some of the re regulatory uh, mechanisms that it is, it is not sufficient for them to just land a product on a market without at least exposing some of the uncertainties that can then at least be addressed. So again, if, if we think about the, the, the European um, perspective, the EMA have done quite a lot at increasing the transparency of their decision making, such and communicating between themselves and HTA bodies to, to in a sense, hand over perhaps a bit more effectively than they used to uh, some of some of those issues. So I'm, I'll leave it there because there's, there's, I think there's rich territory to explore in, in, in terms of, um, you know, how to climb that mountain as quickly as possible, which, which face of the mountain should we be using to get to the top as quickly, uh, as quickly as, as we can. But I, 
notwithstanding every single problem that has been highlighted that I totally concur with, I think we're, I think we're in a cup half full situation. If we choose to exploit it, then in a cup half empty. I think that there are ways now that we can, we can, we can change the dial on how companies who are responsible for, for developing the evidence base do their work and how the signals into that clinical development are taken up and implemented. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carol, for constructive suggestions. And Eric, please take the floor. So just to build on, on Carol's uh, points and some of the points that the, the other panel members have made is that there's a lot of complexity in the system. If, if you mapped out from sort of bench to bedside the different stakeholders that are involved or have a stake in develop, discovering, developing, um, regulating, evaluating, appraising and optimizing uh, treatments, they're multiple. And they're operating in an ecosystem that's completely disconnected. And what, what you see is different vested interests. So different stakeholders want to get different things out of the system. Many of the panel members have alluded to that. They've got different drivers. Uh, they're incentivized in different ways and they're rewarded in different ways. And as long as that's in place, um, it's difficult to move the dial as, as Carol uh, has said. So part of it is around how, how do we get the right incentives in place for everybody to play, play differently um, so that each stakeholder wins, whatever that might mean, but that win is sort of unified around a common goal. And that common goal should be to get um, properly transformative, safe and effective treatments to patients. And why I mentioned this sort of technology push, and that's absolutely right, we, we exist in a push environment. We, you know, downstream uh, from the laboratory, let's just say we react to things that come through the system. It comes through the system in a random way, in different ways. Uh, if, if you know, NASA took that approach to putting a man on the moon, it would never have happened. And yet we, we, we have rules in the system that allow this kind of thing to happen where we don't have a demand side. So part of what we have to do is to think about where does the pool come from? And is that pool voice evidence-based? Is it unified? And who, who is that voice from? And as I guess the patient representative, and we're all patient representatives on the panel because ultimately patient centricity is not something that just sits with the advocate. It's, it's, it's incumbent upon all of us in the system to think about what we're doing for patients. But first and foremost, we need to understand what do patients want? What, you know, we mentioned benefit risk as being something that, that, that's for the kind of regulator, but actually, you know, when you try to, work out what the value of a medicine is. Um, you have to understand, well, what does value mean from a patient perspective? What magnitude of benefit does a new treatment bring? And what is the probability of getting that benefit? Is it one in 10, one in five? And, and where's the risk and what's the probability of getting it? Is the risk serious and the probability of getting it huge? Then the value proposition is very low. That's not what the regulator uh, does. And in HTA, we're not really putting that type of data into the decision-making. So, so I think part of the, the challenge is around how, how do we connect up the system to get uh, a balance between push and pull? How do we get the right uh, alignment in terms of interests? Um, and and, and how, how do we what ultimates is the currency that will cause the change? And, and my belief is it's patient data because research doesn't happen without patients. Um, so we've got to get the patient perspective into the argument and patients need to be saying, or patient groups need to be saying, that clinical trial is not ethical. You cannot do a single arm phase two study in oncology with under 100 patients with surrogate endpoints in six months follow up that that's not acceptable <laughs> and until patients actually start and patient groups and patient advocates start to push back and say this is not acceptable it's hard to see how things will change thank you eric uh, i do have a follow-up question for you because you asked a lot of 
philosophical questions, I would say. Uh, but we do have a, a question in the chat, completely continuing the theme of patient involvement. And the actual question is whether patient perspective is taken into account when evaluating surrogate endpoints, uh, which are used by the industry in the trials. Anyone would like to comment on that? Well, I'll maybe take that first and then I'll be quiet for a bit. Is, is the, it, it's like in, in every therapeutic area, you kind of get a super responder. There's always an example of somebody that does really, really well. And there's always an example of a trial or a clinical development program in which the patient voice has made a big difference. I've been a patient advocate now for nearly 30 years. I started when I was nine, nine years old. I'm, I'm just kidding. And, and I can tell you, I've contributed so much over two, three decades, and I don't believe anything I've ever said has materially impacted on either the design of a commercial study, and let's not forget about academic studies, because that is as much a car crash as, as commercial studies. I don't believe I've had any influence at all. And, and I would consider myself to be sort of an averagely smart lay person. I'm not particularly good or, nor bad, but pretty good, and I haven't had an impact at all. Thank you. Any more specific comments on patient involvement in evaluation of surrogate endpoints? Yes, uh, Lisa, may I? Um, it's, a, it's a difficult question, but I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. I mean, when it comes to, you know, a patient likes to be told that their tumor is not progressing. Now, if that uh, means that over a, a fairly prolonged period, the patient is not experiencing new symptoms of their cancer, that's important. But the problem is that also all new drugs add toxicity. And clearly the uh, value of an endpoint like that really comes down uh, between a balance of improvements in quality of life because of control of symptoms and deterioration of quality of life because what the drug does. And that is often quite severe and negative. And I think to answer that question, you, you really need to look to us specifically about the quality of the survival. And, uh, and that may be different in different diseases. I would like to pick up on one thing I think Carol was saying, and that is this question of value of treatments. You know, Carol was saying that there are ways forward. Well, the large organizations, particularly ESMO, which has stayed with it, that's the European Society of Medical Oncology, has developed a magnitude of clinical benefit scale. Um, ASCO also flirted with this, but has not really pushed it since. But ESMO has continued to do so. And basically, they can look at the results of a clinical trial and set um, some criteria for what is considered a valuable treatment. And, and it relates to changes in survival, changes in quality of life, uh, and toxicity. I mean, it's not rocket science, but they've set out a formalized way of, of doing that. And if we could persuade the regulators to look at a criterion of value for drug registration, rather than a statistical test, which is not very meaningful, and the companies have got around statistical tests by doing larger and larger trials to show that smaller and smaller differences are significant. Unfortunately, again, a study uh, that I was somewhat involved in with, with Chris Booth and colleagues, we looked at the design of randomized trials as to what proportion of them were actually designed to detect or rule out a level of value as per the ESMO magnitude of clinical benefit scale would be regarded as worthwhile. And the answer comes out that only about 30% of trials have even been designed to detect or rule out uh, a benefit that was considered valuable in that system. Uh, and clearly we need to push pharma to design trials that will actually 
uh, either show or, or uh, value or prove that there isn't sufficient evidence of value. And they'll only do that if the registration agencies push them to do it. And, and oncologists and HTA people like yourselves, I think, need to be pushing people uh, to do that. Thank you, Ian. So Carol and then Dan. Yes, two points to wait, make. One immediately on Ian's comments, which, which are, um, you know, absolutely spot on. And for an HTA audience, talking about in effect value and incremental effectiveness um, is, um, is exactly what we need. And unfortunately, not what we get very often in those trials. And, you know, all, all routes into, into this working better um, are a systems approach, as Ian said, and and work and through the regulator working together with the regulator to then specify, signal, instruct. I don't know which one's best, which words best. Um, those that are developing the trials, actually, it wouldn't matter whether or not it's a company or an academic uh, to do to do those in the best possible way. So, absolutely with you, Ian, on on that. But I want to come back to. Um, to your comment, Eric, which is, you know, it's it's such a profound statement you've made. Um, it's such a profound statement you've made. And we really need to recognize that the certainly my view, and I hope other HTA um, experts, that the perspective we need to take is what is meaningful to those who are intending to benefit from the intervention. That's the perspective we need to take. Yet everything that is done in clinical development does not, does not take that perspective at all. And, e and I'm, I'm probably going to be rather controversial here, but, but even when we talk about good endpoints, there's still endpoints that have been developed without the input of patients. It's still, it's, it's still, it's still as difficult as that to get to get that at least that endorsement from a patient perspective that what is being measured is something that they that, that they genuinely wish to wish to see and i think that we need to do much more in all of us in ensuring that somewhere in the system the call for the patient perspective in the development of new clinical endpoints, clinical, clini clinical trials de design, and, and definitely registration trials, which the regulators have, have now recognized, but just keep the call going. I think it would be an extremely important development, and at least it would reinforce the, the, um, the reason that we're all doing this, which is, to, which is the aim to get beneficial treatments into the hands of those that would most benefit from them in a way that's sustainable for a healthcare system. That's the goal. Thank you, Carol. Dan? Thanks, yeah. Um, and, and I'd like to reflect on, on some of Eric's comments as well and, and Ian's too. Uh, the, sticking with oncology for the moment, the, uh, one of the conversations that I'm hearkening back to uh, during my time at ICER was with the cancer support community, which is a relatively large advocacy group here in the U.S. that has a research focus. They have been sounding a drumbeat for many, many years about how uh, these studies inadequately, if at all, capture the low-grade daily toxicities that these cancer patients have to deal with. So there might be good measurement of overall survival, there might even, even be good measurement using standardized quality of life instruments, but those do not capture the impact that these cancers have on the patient's daily life in total. And so, again, it's a situation where they've been talking about this for a long time, people nod their heads sympathetically, and then nothing ever changes in terms of measurement. One of the other things, Eric, that you mentioned around this notion of saying, you know, in this particular situation with this particular cohort of patients, we find this proposed study design completely unacceptable. That seems to be a place where HTA and the patient community can join forces and advocate together. Now, in my connection to the broader international HTA community, it's not as though we are a poster child for good uh, and consistent patient engagement. <laughs> We have a lot of improvements to make there as well, but uh, there's an opportunity here. 
um, I wrote a, a blog piece, I don't know, maybe six or seven months ago, essentially kind of registering my shock at the uh, approach that in this case, it was the US regulator, but a US regulator took to evaluating a gene therapy for hemophilia. This is a condition that we've known about for hundreds of years. We know what the patient important and uh, statistically important measures of outcome are. We evaluated as a community uh, emicizumab, uh, an antibody treatment for hemophilia A a couple of years ago on the basis of a reasonably well-conducted, large-ish randomized controlled trial. The next available treatment for hemophilia A was a gene therapy that the FDA decided to evaluate on the basis of a phase one, two safety study of 15 patients, uncontrolled, uh, and was designed essentially to measure factor eight levels rather than patient important outcomes like joint bleeds and hospitalizations, which makes no sense. So we know the size of the patient population. We know the potential cohort of enrollees. Uh, we don't need to limit ourselves to a study design like that. We can demand the kind of study design that will give us the answers we want. Thank you, Dan. Um, excellent point on, on hemophilia. And I think we have some uh, people in the audience from the community. So via your comment and then Carol. Avaya, you're muted. Sorry. I just want to also to reflect on what Eric said, but also what Ian said. I, I think, um, it's, of course, we need to, to look at the you know, the patient relevant outcomes. Uh, I think we are aligned in this, but I think we were talking about the, the role of industry, but I think we should also talk about the role of the clinician because they are also uh, part of the clinical trial. And I think that we as HCA community are also not well aligned with the, with the, with, with the clinical societies in, in itself. So I, I, I have more a question for both Eric and, and, and Ian, actually, how can we uh, join forces between the communities, the patients, the clinicians, and then the HA community. And I'm asking also with regard to what we were discussing before about the uh, parallel scientific advice or scientific advice in general, because it seems to be that there is scientific advice, non-regulatory scientific advice, and there is regulatory scientific advice. And I do know that in the UK, at least is what I understood that for NICE, that patients and clinicians are working together in that particular uh, scientific advice. Uh, but I, I'm not quite sure about other countries if, if, if we have the same, we don't have the same in the Netherlands, for example. But so, so there is some movement, but still it's very small and it's of course very targeted to the UK market. So I'm, I'm wondering, can we broaden that scope? Just very, very briefly for me why I am, um... I think great, great points. I think I've often advocated to patient groups and, and clinicians that they should see HT as their friend, not their foe, because they see it as, as their foe. And we can help each other out by strategically aligning on, on that demand side. There's absolutely no question about it. I think also is, uh, Dan mentioned that the trial, it may not be one study, it may not be one trial, that is sufficient to generate the data that, that decision makers in the system need. So we need strategic evidence development. And, and that may mean aligning the research efforts of health systems and clinicians to those of industry. So that a well-designed uh, UK-based phase 2B study, for example, might be sufficient to mitigate against the uncertainties even of a well-designed appropriate regulatory study. And that would be a great way to bring the clinical and research environment uh, and, and, and networks into the clinical development program. It's good for a country because of inward investment, you know, all that stuff in the, the industrial strategy. Um, and in the context of scientific advice, and, and Lisa and I have got some experience about this is that the scientific advice should be available for clinical, um, sorry, academic studies as well. So the package that's ultimately submitted should be a combination of 
the regulatory data, um, local um, data from academic studies, well-designed studies, all of which has been run through scientific advice. So that, that would be one way to do it. And in a past life at Malamu UK, in fact, we designed an academic clinical trial network that was set up to partner with industry to, to share that burden of evidence development through academic hybrid studies. And, and we pioneered a scientific advice product with Lisa's help through NICE, where the company would take their regulatory data and the data from the, the um, academic clinical trial and present it as a package. So that's just one example of where some of the, I think, uh, um, issues in the system can be mitigated by aligning uh, efforts of clinicians, patients, the regulator, the HT body and, 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 and industry. I'm conscious I'm waffling, so I'm going to start, stop there and let Ian come in to answer your question. Thank you, Ian and then Carol. So uh, two points. One in terms of what Vaya is saying for liaisons between HTA uh, and uh, value systems. I, I actually think that the people I know well at ESMO who have developed the clinical value scales led by Nathan Chomi in, in Israel, I think they, I mean, they may already have these liaisons with some of you, but I, I'm fairly sure these are very open-minded people um, and they would welcome that type of liaison because they would love to influence the regulators and the HTA agencies so that clinical value becomes established as a criterion on which drugs are first approved and then uh, made available, funded in, in different countries. So I, I'm sure they would be enthusiastic about doing that. And if that happened, it would have a secondary effect because it would push the pharmaceutical companies uh, to recognize that they have to meet value criteria. So that, that's point one. The other thing is about scientific advice. And here I'm perhaps being a, a little bit of a downer. I have sat occasionally on uh, committees put together by companies to give advice about trials. But, you know, people, the clinicians who take part in those, a lot of them are being paid quite handsomely. I personally don't accept funds from, from industry, but a lot of them are. And there is, if you start to sort of push for things like uh, value systems or endpoints. When it comes down to it, the company are going to get their drug to market as quickly as they possibly can. And if the FDA and the EMA say you can do that with an endpoint like progression free survival instead of overall survival, that probably cuts about a year off the length of their, the, of their treatment. And that's a year gain before the drug goes off patent. And, and that's the way the industry people think. And to be honest, many of the clinicians see that as, well, I can't really influence that because that's the way things are. And uh, unfortunately, I think there's not enough clinicians really a lot, uh, making, allying themselves with the, what is really best needed for patients in that trial sense. And they need to separate, let's get this drug to market as quickly as possible to is this the appropriate drug to get to market with appropriate evidence? And, uh, and I think we need more independent panels. Personally, I think that people sitting on FDA advisory panels and NCCN advisory panels should be forbidden from having funding from pharmaceutical companies. You know, I, I wrote an article some time ago, an editorial called Purchasing Silence. And this is what the companies are doing. They're purchasing silence of, unfortunately, many of my colleagues by giving them handsome honorarium. Thank you, Ian. So let's take a comment from Carol and then Frank. Carol, you're muted. Yes. As always, Lisa, a few comments. Um, firstly, on, um, on uh, Ian's, Ian's point, I, I don't think that HTA advisors would have any problem whatsoever telling companies uh, that they need to do uh, incremental effectiveness, comparative incremental effectiveness trials. Um, the issue is how often do you have that perspective actually in the advisory discussion? 
either in, in uh, industry sponsored um, uh, ad advisory panels or or in the the, the formal scientific ad advice processes it isn't it isn't in happening often enough um, and the way that companies tend to use a, a HTA advisors is much more on the commercial value proposition than the clinical value proposition and that is that um, that's unfortunate because there's so much to talk about on the clinical value proposition and there's no point going to the commercial value proposition until you've had that conversation um, so i'll get off my soapbox on that one the, the second the second thing is um and maybe it's a, a little bit of a bridge to uh, to to what others have said i, I said in the in my introduction the evidence is never going to be sufficient for, for an HTA decision, mainly because of the timing that an HTA decision needs to be made, uh, which is close to regulatory approval. You never have the information you, you need to get a full perspective of, of value and incremental effectiveness. And also because HTA generally takes a lifetime horizon, it wants to look at the full course of, um, of the condition over time and the impact of new technologies on that. You're, you're, you're in a circumstance where you never will have that evidence base. We know we, that the evidence base that can be presented um, at the point of decision could be much better than it is now, We've talked about that. But the other thing that perhaps we haven't explored yet is what, what technical tools and what scientific tools we can deploy to actually bridge and maximize the value of the evidence that we do have. And I think, again, um, from an HTA perspective, the, the, the use of those, those tools, if I can put it that way, um, has increased over time and has been useful. So just an example, it was, um, it's been brought up before, the relationship between progression-free survival and overall survival. Um, there are ways to be able to model that in an evidence-based way. We know that, that different cancers that relationship is not the same. So you can't, you can't generalize from one cancer to another, for, even for the same product. But there are techniques that would, would allow you, would allow you as a decision maker to feel comfortable in using PFS in certain circumstances, in certain conditions. And so the sophistication of the methodology, if I could put it that way, of HTA can help to some degree to mitigate um, the issues that we've uh, that, that we've highlighted and explored. It doesn't take the way the need to do everything that we've already discussed. Thank you, Carol. What's what, what are your comments? Hi, Lisa. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. So. Yeah, great. Um, on the um, Inclinations uh, and going together with patients and HTA for uh, advice, I think that synergy should definitely be used because what we see now is um, if there is parallel advice that the regulator's advice is followed and the HTA advice is not followed by the companies. Um, for many reasons. Um, why would uh, the company do this uh, comparative trial with, uh, that is more costly and, and more risky, uh, finally, because you risk to show that you don't have a benefit. So, and, and the problem with the post-marketing situation is that at that moment, even as we heard, when you show there is no efficacy in the post-market phase, it's very frustrating for all the parties to withdraw a product from the reimbursement from the market. So you're in a different setting when you are in the post-market compared with the pre-market setting. And that is why it is so crucial to have a full package as full as possible already in the pre-market phase, because it's a missed opportunity if you postpone it to the post-market phase. So that is, I think, important to take into account. And, and if it is then uh, in a post-market phase, it, then it should be a research use only situation where only patients entering the, 
a large pragmatic randomized trial or so are, are, are uh, reimbursed. Uh, I, and I think that we should think about incentives also for industry and, and co-financing of, of uh, because indeed the trials that take longer, um, the healthcare payers have um, also their an interest to have the evidence developed. So I think there we need to have a more a, a helicopter view to see the full picture from the start of the clinical development to uh, an evidence-based decision that can reach the patient. Um, and that should be in the, uh, a period that is as short as possible, independent of the parties involved. And, and there we, that's where we should start, I think. Over. Thank you, Frank. Uh, then I'll take your comment in just a second. I'd like to challenge the panel with the following question. You suggested many um, solutions and expressed different wishful thinking scenarios of what the life should be, or what things should be. What, from your perspective, are the current key bottlenecks? And I think many of them were listed. And how would you reflect on them? Are we dealing with the resource problem, saying, are we dealing with the designation problem where each agency says, that's not my remit? Uh, do we not have enough authority in the system? Do we not have enough drive? Because I think there's plenty of understanding in the system. So there is a lot of um, kind of theoretical knowledge, but we have this trouble getting things into practice. And one excellent example, I think about this is uh, uh, managed access agreements, where I think the idea is absolutely brilliant, the way it's been um, proposed to say it connects to the point that Frank was making that, okay, we have to get drugs to the market quickly, but let's create the system where we generate this evidence, where we get the comparative evidence. And as a result, uh, it's not really working because of many oncologists, top example, many poorly performing drugs that probably should not be on the market, or at least not cost more than they are costing compared to other therapies, continue to be priced at the premium and remain on the market because we're not fulfilling those comparative studies. So we're doing it 20 years later. This evidence comes up way, way, way too late. So uh, we can continue the discussion. Of course, Dan, go ahead with your comment, but I'd love to hear from you kind of uh, identification of these bottlenecks and potential solutions. Thanks, Lisa. So I'll, I'll try to, to morph my comment into something that, that also answers that question because I know we're, we're short on time. Uh, but uh, kind of following on on something that Frank said about how uh, when early advice is offered, uh, innovators will focus on what the regulators say and not necessarily adhere to what HTA says. So I think in general, the, the bottleneck for me is in this lack, either lack of standard setting or lack of authority to enforce those standards that are set. So I could envision, for example, I know that uh, those HTA bodies that offer early advice do it on a voluntary basis, it's not compulsory. But as part of that, voluntary agreement, HTA could make it clear to the manufacturer that their advice will be generated from their expectations, their internal reference case for what they want to see when it comes time to make a submission. And if what ends up coming in violates the reference case, then the manufacturer needs to know that's not going to end well for them. I'm not sure that that conversation is happening in that way, and maybe it should. So. Uh, we already talked about issues like trial design. I think that HTA and HTA, hopefully in concert with the patient community, could, could develop a set of standards, even a set of standards that uh, is condition or disease specific, um, to say, this is what we expect for evidence. And uh, if, there, if something will depart from that, we need a very good reason why. Thank you, Eric. Just to pick up on, on, on Dan's point, which I agree on, I think one of the challenges, that, that, at least from a UK perspective, we've got is the, 
pressure on HD decision making that often comes from government and, and ministers uh, who've got, again, a different agenda. It's mostly an industrial strategy. Um, and therefore, it's very difficult for, for NICE to say no. And there's all kinds of flexibilities in the system. Uh, Lisa expressed some of these in, in her introductory slides, uh, discounts, managed access, all, all kinds of things. And, and, and that, I think, it has some upsides. There's no question it has some upsides, but there's downsides as well because it, it, it de-incentivizes these suppliers to bring better data, to bring better input, because we know, at least in the UK, at NICE, there will be some sort of lever or some sort of something to help get them over the line. And it's a bit like marking poor homework. And in the context of managed access, it absolutely has huge potential, but it should be reserved for the, the data sets that fit the reference case that the companies demonstrated they've done everything possible to mitigate against uncertainty. And the uncertainty there is just a fact. And therefore, it, it would qualify for managed access, but managed access should not be used for, for, for uh, a data set that's been mishandled and misdesigned because that is not, not it's like encouraging our kids to misbehave all the time. It, it doesn't work. So, so just a few reflections on, 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 on Dan's points. And I'm gonna think about your question, Lisa. I'll come back to you. Thank you. Um, all right, Frank and then Carol. Yeah, on, on managed entry agreements, I think they are great to control the budget, but not to generate evidence. And some people think that just giving uh, by pro a non-public discount will create effectiveness. Some people really think that, and <laughs> we need to convince them that is not the case. F effectiveness is not changed just by the price. Over. Excellent point. Um, so Carol and then Maya. Quick comment on that last point by Frank, which is a really important point. And if you're if you think if you're thinking about um, evidence generation um, in conditions of un uncertainty, that uncertainty actually does have a value, <laughs> and 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 it can be that 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 value discussion can be de deployed on the price side if you if you wish. Now I, I don't know if if we want to if, if we want to go there, but in we, with agencies that are looking at clinical and cost effectiveness. The value, the value of collecting information, additional information, can be offset against the willingness to pay threshold. And so it is a really, it's an interest. It's, it's probably not for this one, maybe for another one, uh, Lisa. But there are, there are, um, you know, you can think about it in that way. In that, I, although from a purist point of view, so I'm not taking my. My, my, my sort of pure evidence uh, based perspective here, because you would always wish to reduce that uncertainty with further, with further evidence. But from a decision making perspective in a reimbursement, in a reimbursement um, uh, situation, you, you, ca you, can, you can mitigate those two things. So I, I just want to, again, throw that one out there, uh, probably not for, for now for subsequent uh, panel sessions. What I what I wanted to touch on was your was your challenge. What are the bottlenecks? What are the the issues? I've got three, and uh, we've already touched on one. The, the, the other panel members, and that's incentives, um, or or the sort of incentives and disincentives to do the right thing. I don't think we're I don't think we are sophisticated um, as an HTA community in in that regard. I think regulators the the, the um, you know, the standard regulatory processes are much more sophisticated in that way. So I think we could do better there. The other, the other two uh, issues, bottlenecks, are alignment and timing. Again, we've both we've we've touched on this already. So with the timing, we absolutely need to be having conversations about evidence generation earlier than we currently do. So that's Frank Frank's point. It just 
we just need to find ways of being able to do that. Scientific advice is one mechanism at the moment. It's not the it's not the only one. Um, probably we should we should we should be trying to get our HTA advisors on the advisory panels that that companies are using because that conversation will then happen. It may not be taken up, but at least it's going to happen. Uh, the alignment, I think, the the biggest change that could happen, and it is. Um, I'm very hopeful, certainly in the UK, that there is the prospect of this, is that a regulator and an HTA body sit together and decide and design what they are going to say to companies. And that is, that is then a jointly endorsed advice process, and that needs to be taken up in through the regulatory pro process and the regulators are also checking that as well and then when it comes on to the to the uh health technology assessment hopefully the both the but both the evidence is there but also the alignment between the regulatory and the hta body has already been in a sense um, baked in to the clinical development process i think that would be the biggest change that could happen Thank you, Carol. Uh, excellent points. Completely agree on everything. My biggest question to this is what is the driver and the push for this? What can make this obligatory? Because we've been having this system in place for a while and the problem is it's advisory. It's an option. And uh, we've, I think it gave us amazing practice to come up with all these solutions, but we don't have uh, a compulsory system, so to speak, in place to clean it up, to really make this work for everything, not for three active companies who decided to approach the process. So we need to think of the trigger who, who can do this actually. So Eric and uh, Vaya. Just if I very quickly to two things on the answer to your question in terms of where the bottlenecks are, I think just to to build on sort of Carl is, is that I think the, the demand side, if the demand side is weak, the system won't work. And I think it's incumbent upon patients, patient advocacy groups and clinicians and nurses, let's not forget in the wider MDT in any therapeutic area to map out and invest in, to understand what do they want? What do they need? What are the red lines? Um, how do they see the treatment pathway in the next 10 years? Um, and until that happens, and we've got a bunch of sort of patient advocacy groups and medical research charities funding billions of research that's pointless and meaningless, they should be investing in, in methodologies and projects to prioritize research, to understand what the most important clinical questions are that need answered either by industry. And it's a bit like, you know, you don't have, and maybe this is not a good analogy, people building aircraft carriers and helicopters and rocking up to the Ministry of Defence and knocking on the door saying, I built a helicopter, do you want to buy it? Um, what they, they do, I think they do it badly, is, is, is the write, write a blueprint of this is what we need in a helicopter, we need it to do this, do that, and the next thing, go out to tender and the best company designs that helicopter, it's 10 years late and it's six times more expensive, not normally, but it's that kind of conceptual mind shift that we need that clinicians and patients can drive is to, to better understand what do we need and give that, give that tender to industry and say, we need these drugs. And if you get these drugs to us, that pool is going to be there. And that to me is a massive bottleneck. And just on sort of managed access and risk, because I think people have made some very good points about that. And, and it's, to, it's to manage the financial risk, the, the risk, the unknowns of the drug, they don't go because of that, but we're transferring that risk onto patients who are often making decisions about treatment under very difficult circumstances. So that risk doesn't disappear. And we have no evidence really on what level of risk is acceptable to patients. We assume that every patient will do whatever it takes to survive three more weeks or three more months. It's absolutely not true. People will trade quality for duration and we just need to reflect on how we would advise our loved ones, say with cancer in these situations, we would not be saying, take that next treatment. We'd be saying, look, weigh up the pros and cons. You know, do you want a good death, a bad death? Do you want to, how do you want to die effectively? 
we've got no evidence for any of this. And until we get that, I don't think we're going to get the change in the system that we need. Thank you, Eric. Very powerful, fully agree. So uh, via Frank and Dan. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, for me, uh, I think um, Carol Carol nailed it very clearly. I think also for me, I think the most important, well, there are two actually. First, the alignment with the regulatory process. I think we should be focusing on identifying the uncertainties that both the regulatory agencies have and the HGA bodies have and discussing them indeed together what the necessary evidence would be, and then also the timing for the generation of that evidence. And this should not be indeed voluntary, but mandatory. And I'm also wondering if the EMA and the FDA could work together in that respect. Um, so that's one thing. Um, but before that, I think the issue mentioned both by, by, by several panelists is the incentives. We should not forget that we have in Europe, we have European regulation for drugs, for orphan drugs, for pediatric medicines. Um, and these incentives, I mean, the, the regulation has been evaluated. I've evil, evaluated the, the regulation myself. And there are very, uh, how you call that, um, um, uneven incentives in the regulation. And of course, the European Commission tries to circumvent or you know withdraw or make it different but it's very difficult and i think that's one thing because there are incentives for industry to make these drugs and there are indeed there are very little uh, uh incentives for academics to get money for you know um research in areas where there is high unmet need and i think the alignment between i think that was what eric tried to say is indeed what are what are the needs and maybe you you could look at European European perspective or countries in Europe but of course we also have other countries we are now talking about Europe but our epidemiology profile and needs is completely different from the maybe the partly the US the Latin America Asia Africa and I think that if we could align but that's my wishful thinking maybe but I think Policymakers should be more aware of this. I mean, COVID clearly showed that there was a need for vaccines. And of course, then there was a huge push. And of course, industry was interested because there, there was some gain to be to be win, right? So um, I don't know how we can align or how we can, as an HA community, because this is a systems discussion and it involves the whole well, policymakers at the European level, at least, to align research priorities, industry policies, and and of course access to to care. And uh, to me, that's a, it's a huge it's a huge issue that we as HCA community cannot cannot well we can influence, but we do not have the authority, and that's the problem. We are sometimes at the sideline, and that is frustrating. <laughs> but at least we can put it on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Vaya. And indeed, everything we're discussing will be documented. We're recording this, and uh, the idea is to put things on the agenda. So, Frank, and then Dan. Yes, I, I think we, we are in, in a special time now, because now in Europe, at least, we have this HDA regulation uh, starting. Uh, we have the pharmaceutical framework uh, being uh, started and the rework of it. Um, so I think it's the right time to have the European Commission also involved as well as the, the member state governments uh, to together then HDA bodies with uh, clinicians, the scientific societies and the patient organizations uh, to uh, indeed uh, ask for more comparative evidence already in, in the, the pre-market situation and one point that has not been discussed yet is the possibility of, of having platform trials um, to generate this comparative evidence. Uh, because by definition, then you also have a harmonization of the trial endpoints uh, in, in this platform trial, um, like, like the, even the companion diagnostics for the immunotherapy uh, 
where things went wrong because uh, every company selected another companion diagnostic and in the routine care, it's, it's kind of a mess now. Um, so I think this is also something we need to think about. Uh, over. Thank you, Frank. Um, Dan? Thanks. So uh, I was thinking about a couple of things, um, trying to link both the, the post-decision environment with managed entry and managed access and the early advice environment. I wonder if some principles around this notion of war gaming, it's not the greatest term, but, but you'll, you'll see what I'm trying to say, might be set forth, meaning manufacturer could describe a couple of scenarios under which this compound and development might be approved. One of which could be a traditional regulatory timetable, another could involve some sort of accelerated approval. And then expectations could be set for those multiple scenarios around what HTA would want to or need to see. So for something accelerated, then some of that evidence will have to be generated in the post-decision space. But there could be guardrails put around that. So um, there are others on this panel who can speak to how successful the current iteration of the Cancer Drugs Fund is, is being, is going. Um, but it seems to me that there are some interesting guardrails that have been set around that with, a, a, frankly, a time limit on the generation of additional evidence. If that evidence is not generated, then the product essentially is de-adopted, disinvested from. Contrast that with leaving those expectations in the hands of the regulator. You have the, the aducanumab approval by the FDA in the US with an expectation that the manufacturer could produce confirmatory evidence in within nine years. A trial will take 18 to 24 months at most to conduct and produce those confirmatory endpoints. But uh, if things stay the way they are with those kinds of loose expectations, then we won't get what we need. And as Frank said, managed access will turn into a cost cutting or cost management exercise, or, or will stay that way for the most part. Excellent point, Dan. So um, any final reflections? We have a few minutes left to wrap up. Um, I think we had really, really strong theme discussing the importance of alliance between regulatory and um, regulators and HTAs. It's nothing new on the agenda. We've, we've been doing this for, for a long time, um, but it remains a, a huge issue, a huge question. So our next event on the 2nd of December is dedicated exactly to this issue. Um, and um, my personal experience working with the EMA has been uh, very enriching, fascinating. I think we've made fantastic progress over the years. And uh, my only uh, regret right now is it seems uh, we're losing this momentum that has been built because of Brexit, because of NICE not involving, um, not being involved with EMA, uh, there is of course UK system in place, but I think uh, it's very important to discuss this issue. So our next event uh, will feature speakers from the regulatory agencies and uh, um, raising all these questions, trying to come up with solutions with uh, potential policy perspectives. So for today, I very much thank our panel. I very much thank our guests uh, for very fruitful discussion. Um, we made the recording, which will be available online tomorrow. I realize many people cannot attend live events, uh, but it's very important learning for the community, for uh, practitioners, theoretic theorists, but most importantly to patients, clinicians, and actually decision makers. So our aim is to try to uh, collect all the um, points, questions, uh, wishes, solutions uh, across the four events to see if we can uh, make sense out of it, uh, to see if uh, productive policy proposals 
can be made to really start making changes rather than just keeping at the level of a dialogue. So once again, thank you very much to everyone who joined today. Um, and we look forward to seeing you in a few months. So have a good evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.